This conference will now be recorded. Joni, whenever you're ready. I'm sorry, I was speaking with the mic off. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. God bless you all. Giving honor to God who is the head of our lives. I give him glory today. And to our pastor, Reverend Frank Hawkins, to Sister Brenda Foreman, our Christian educator, our director, and to Sister Catherine Hill, our superintendent of Sunday school, and to Deacon Brian. And to all leaders in their prospective places, God bless you. And as well to you, my sisters and brothers in Christ, God bless you. I'm going to first open up in prayer. That would be in order right now. Father, we come, God, to your throne of grace, O oh God. Thanking you, Jesus. God, we thank you this morning that you woke us up, O oh God. God, we thank you that our minds are still intact. We are giving you honor and glory, God. We praise you for that, oh God. We thank you, God, because you're still sovereign, God. Oh God, you're the ruler of the universe, oh God. You're the keeper, oh God, and you're the lover of our soul, God. So, Father, I thank you for that, dear Jesus. And, Lord, I ask that you would bless us this morning, God, as we study to show ourselves approval. Workmen need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing your word, O oh God, of truth. So, Father, I welcome the Holy Spirit to teach us and guide us, O oh God. O oh, Father, I pray that you would correct us. You will encourage us this morning and exalt us, O oh God, to do the things that you would have us to do, O oh God that we may not fall short of your glory, God. So, Father, we thank you, God, for everything, God. And in the name of Jesus, God, I praise and worship you, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. I thank each and every one of you. I thank those that, that had a beautiful walk this morning. God presented a wonderful day for you. And I wasn't there, and I needed to be there, but God bless you all. We're going to start this morning off with the lesson that's presented to us for September 11th, 2022. So our unit lesson is God Calls Abraham Family. Our title of our lesson today is God Chooses the Younger Twin. God Chooses the Youngest Twin or the Younger Twin. I'm trying something a little different, so that's got to get my balance together. Let me get this here. Okay. So God chose us the younger twin. So here we have, I'm just going to give a little background on, we're studying the, in the book of Genesis. And I'm grateful to go back to the beginning. The beginning, Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 to 35. Our lesson is talking about what we, many of us call the patriarchs, hallelujah, the fathers that have laid the foundation in the word that we may be taught, that teaches us how to live and how to go through this journey of life. So we know that when God blesses his people, he has a specific plan for them. And that's our lesson today we'll see that God blesses Esau and Jacob to become the fathers of two nations, Edom, which is Esau, and Israel, which is Jacob. Even through their rivalries, we'll see that God has a specific plan for each of them in history. Ultimately, the house of Jacob will win. The Messiah and the descendants of Jacob will reign. And will call to and they are called to receive him, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So history is moving forward towards the final and glorious end. Amen. Can I get someone to read Genesis 25? Can I get a reader this morning? And could you read Genesis the 25 up to? 26 
and then another reader from 27 to 35? Yes, Amen. 25, you said? Yes, chapter 25, 19 to 26. Thank you, baby. Yes. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Jacob. Abraham became the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padan Aram and the sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jolted each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to the Lord to inquire. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, mm -hmm. and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were, two tw there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. Okay. Do we have another reader? So, okay, can you continue to 35 for me, please? Yes, ma'am. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom. Yeah. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Amen. Hello? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 35. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is this birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our key text this morning is, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Okay. Okay. Someone has to close their mic, please. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on. Okay, verse 19, the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Isaac became the father of Isaac. I, Abraham became the father of Isaac, I'm sorry. So the generation record of Isaac descended begins with Abraham. Abraham was Isaac's father. Verse 20, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethulah Amarin from Pandara and sister of Leban and Amarin. Forgive me if the pronunciation is not proper. So although we don't know how old Rebekah was when she married Isaac, what we do know that she was the cousin of Laban, that we'll keep in mind Laban, because we're going to hear Laban later on in our um, classes, because Laban is a very important character in Genesis. 
So Rebecca was Laban cousin. So really when we look at Isaac was the daughter. So here we have, she was the daughter of Bethua, the son of, of, of Sarian, who was the youngest son of Abraham brother. Okay, so she was actually a relative. If we look into the ancient world, the culture back then, they married within each other. It was a common practice. So we have verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on the behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. So Isaac fervently prayed to the Lord and Rebecca could not receive, could not conceive a child. She was, they were married 20 years before she was able to conceive. So what Isaac did was he went to God fervently praying on the behalf of his wife so that the Lord would intervene and allow his wife Rebecca to conceive. One of the things I want to point out is that the husband is the covering of the wife. And it is necessary that a man prays for his wife as well as his family because he covers his wife. So Isaac understood that, that as he went to the Lord praying, the Lord answered his prayers and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. So here we have, it was 40, he was 40 years old when he married Rebecca, but they didn't have any children until he was 60 years old. So it was 20 years within their marriage that she could not conceive. I would like someone to read 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, because no doubt, Isaac and Rebecca felt helpless. No doubt did they feel that there was nothing that they personally could do. What they knew was that God was able to intercede on their behalf. So I want us to read, when we're helpless, what are we to do when we don't have the strength to do it on our own? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient. Good morning. Is sufficient. Okay. Good morning. Thank you. I'm, 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 9 and 10? Yes. 2 Corinthians said, 12, 9 and, and 10. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glorify, glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Ten, yes. therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then yes. am I strong. Okay, amen, amen. Thank you, thank you. So although, although we know that our God is sovereign, he still wants us to bring our request to him in prayers. So, and when we make that request according to his will, he has promised to answer them. So I just want to make sure that it's according to his will. Um, I believe sometimes when we seek the Lord and we are asking God for things and, and part of that is just that we're human, that we are asking and seeking the Lord to to move on our behalf and, and whether it's a job, whether it's in our family, um, in our personal lives. And we tend to, not only we ask God, but we also put on the prayer, what we, how he, we want him to answer our prayers. And it's so important that we understand that the way God answer prayers is according to his will, his promises. And so we can request, and we always should go to God. But I believe sometimes we even miss when he answers the prayer because we expect him to answer the prayer the way we want him to. We put him in such a box that we say, well, God, I want you to answer it this way. And God answers that prayer. 
but it may not be the way that we want it to be. But we can understand that, well, one thing I'll guarantee you, it's the best for us. I'll put it that way. However he answers that prayer, it is what we need for that particular point in time. God doesn't miss the mark. We serve a sovereign God, a perfect God. So if our prayers are in his perfect will, they will come to pass. And at, and so I want to also add, it has to be according to his timing. So God answered Rebecca and Isaac prayers. And Isaac and Rebecca conceived a child. Amen. So it was according to his will. It took 20 years, and that's a long time. Um, and if you kind of, I know I've prayed for some things, and it seems to be forever. But as I grow, I understand it's according to his will. He probably answered it in some ways, but I'm still praying for it to work the way I would like it to work. And that's not the will of God. So he answered the prayer 20 years later, how much patience that they needed to have the weight on the Lord. And so looking at that principle in our own lives, we can look back and, and, and say that we need to be patient when we go to bring our troubles and concern to, to the Lord, our oppositions, our anxiety to the throne of grace, we can rest assured that God will answer. But that prayer requires patience, perseverance, persistence, and waiting. And so once we understand that it won't come immediately, but we serve a God that will answer, will respond to our prayers. And so as we look at Rebecca and Isaac, I want us to also look at Abraham, his father. Remember, Abraham and Sarah could not have children. And so here's the contrast. They could not have children, but they went, they didn't seek the Lord. Sarah went and took her handmaid servant to her husband so he can conceive a child for her. And this is the person called Ismail. And so we understand what happened when Sarah and Isaac came one. Well, Isaac is Sarah's son and Ismail is Haggai's son. And what happened to Abraham in that? It created a problem. It created opposition. In fact, Sarah got jealous of Ismail. So when we do things on our own, when we step out without on the will of God, without the will of God, then the trouble that we may occur has nothing to do with him. It's that we made that decision on our own. And throughout this lesson, I want to bring to you how this will, we'll see some of the things in our own personal lives that um, conflict with God or that we can realign ourselves with God when we do things on our own. Um, this here was sort of like a, it was, I call it like a dysfunctional family in some ways. And we have that today where um, families don't, we don't operate according to the will of God. And so anytime when you don't operate in the will of God, then you got some dysfunctionalness there. Verse 22, the babies jostle each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. What I like about this is they knew God. What I like is they always went to inquire or pray to the Lord. So they weren't far, they knew who God was. But Sometimes we do things on our own. So during Rebecca pregnancy, what happened was the two babies were struggling within her, the twins. At this point, she didn't know that she had twins. So the children were struggling within her. I went to look up the word jostling, and it said a violent struggle. So these babies, even within their mother womb, 
were having conflict. So it says the children struggle within her. We know that they were having a violent con conflict within her womb. So Rebecca sought the Lord counseling and she went to God in prayer. And so what I also was thinking here, when she went to the Lord and as we would go to the Lord, we would ask God, but well, you gave me these children, you allowed me to conceive. You allowed me to conceive these babies and I don't know what's going on. We know she's never been pregnant before. So I believe that she's seen other women conceive children and may not have had this same medical condition at that time. I'll call it a medical condition at that time. They weren't struggling. The children weren't struggling within themselves. So she had some concern about the birth of this baby. So the struggle between the two babies in Rebecca womb was an indication, not only that the struggle that would take place between Esau and Jacob as they grew up, but it also was a struggle between their descendants. And the descendants of Esau were the Edenites who hated the Israelites. The Edomites are Esau people and the Israelites are Jacob people. And we'll begin to see that later on as we study the additional Sunday school lessons. There were two nations within her. So verse number 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and the two people from within you will be separate. One person will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. God answered Rebecca. He reveals that the moment within her, that the movements that were within her were far reached. They were nations. The Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb and thy will give birth to twins and each one will become the head of a nation. Two nations were Israel and the descendants of Jacob and Edom. The descendants of Esau, we know that the history of Israel revealed that two nations were consistently at war with each other. And we can see that in Samuel 14, 47. So God also said the two manner of people should be separated from her bowels. Well, when I looked at the words bowels, I looked at the word intestines, I looked at they will be separated from her. I was looking at they they are not compatible. They are incompatible from the beginning. So finally, as she gives birth to these children, God also prior prophesied to her and let her know that the firstborn would be Esau. But even before the birth, God declared that the elder should serve the younger, Jacob. And so this was a reversal of what was normally happening in the Jewish family. Because in the Jew Jewish culture, the firstborn son, the oldest son held the highest position in the family and received the largest share of the inheritance. As well as the elder, so this was not going to be. God had already prophesied to her, informed her, of the difference between the children that was within her. So now we know that our God is sovereign and he's always at work. He chose Jacob over Esau. And that's a little contrary to what we believe as how our family should be. I have two sons. I have an older son, of course, and a younger one. I, and, and I did depend a lot on my oldest because that's sort of like how families do. The oldest take range, they, they help, they, they, you trust them, you um, believe that they can handle things a little differently. And I also believe sometimes after the first, you're pushing him on or her on and you receive the second and you do things a little differently. 
But we also see in this family later on how the parents had favoritism. The mother chose Jacob and the father chose Esau. And one of the things in our own families, we have to be careful not to chose favoritism in our children. Amen. Because God, you know, we create a lot of problems within a family when we cho- when we select or chose favoritism. I'm going to get this together for you in a minute. So, so later on, um, as I was reading, this, you know, and studying a little bit, this wasn't an isolated incident based on God um, and his eternal plan for Israel elect. There was other occasions when the Lord replaced the oldest in favor of the youngest, as in the case of Cain and Abel, Ismael and Isaac. So Isaac was the second boy. Ismael was the first. Isaac was the chosen, not Ismael. Reuben and Joseph, remember Reuben and Joseph and Joseph, the coat of many colors, and Reuben. None of these cases did God chose a man that would have or would would have the would be priority. God chose the second. So it's a mystery to us. And and so we don't understand God ways are not our ways. God ways are not our ways. So here in Romans 9, 16, Paul says, so then it is not of him that will or run. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, Jesus. Romans 9, 19, Paul says, so then it is not of him that will it's nor of him that run it, but of God who show mercy. Verse 24, what the time came for her to give birth, there was two twins in her womb. Verse 25, the first two came out red and his whole body was like hairy garment. So the name was Esau. Esau was a rugged appearance and was indicated of the kind of life that he would live. Undoubtedly, the hairy coat of the skin that was was um, that he was born with apparently did not go away. For many years, Jacob would say, behold, Esau, my son, is a hairy man. His rugged, sturdy exterior was matched by his personality that did not appreciate life or the higher things of life. Verse 26, after this, his brother came out with his hand, grabs in Esau hill, and he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Jacob, when Rebekah gave birth. Esau came out of Rebekah womb, then came, then his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau hill. As Esau, twin brother followed him from the womb, he grabbed hold of Esau, Esau hill. So his name was called Jacob. Then we were told that Isaac was three score years old when he bared them. So he was 60 years old when Rebecca gave birth to her sons. Like Esau, Jacob also revealed his personality. Although he was born second, Jacob was as a tendency to be a loner. He pursued his brother from the womb trying to grasp everything he could from him. Sometimes later, Jacob deceitfully ways of getting what he wanted eventually caused Esau to to cry bitterly saying, it is not he rightly, rightly named Jacob, for he was a supplanter. And the word supplanter was replace me these two times. But also we will see later on that Jacob was a manipulator. He was a con artist. He had a tendency, was not wrong in himself, but he was deceitful. Verse 27, the boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of an open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. The tents, 28, Jacob, who had a taste of wild game, loved Esau but Rebecca loved Jacob. And 29, 
once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famish. So I'll go back and explain 28. 28, Isaac had a taste for wild game. Loved Esau, but Rebecca loved Jacob. So we hear, again, I'm talking about showing favoritism to children and the family can produce devices, family problems. Isaac and Rebecca made a grievous mistake by showing favoritism and partiality between Esau and Jacob. It is critical that the parents be impartial and not show favoritism when dealing with their children. It can have lasting, lasting and damaging effects on a family. We know that at early onset, the lifestyle of the two sons were encouraged by the parents who chose sides. So even Isaac, he knew the prophecy that the older would serve the younger. Nevertheless, he loved Esau, but his motives were not proper. We are told that Isaac loved Esau because he did eat his venom. In other words, Esau gained his father favor through the game he killed and cooked. So we see here that Esau's father enjoyed his food. Jacob enjoyed the, um, the fresh kill that Esau would go out and hunt. And if we can imagine, you got a child and he's out there hunting, let's, I'll use it as working. He's working, he's working, and, and he's out there uh, making money. And you tend to, you know, most men like that. That's, that's a, wow, I like to see my son work. I like to see him um, be productive. And, and he was out in the world, so he was killing. In that culture, of course, it was killing game and cooking. So Isaac enjoyed that. So that was one of his reasons for favorites, favoritism um, to Isaac. But here you have Rebecca who loved her son who stayed home. And so a mother often attracts to the son who's obedient, orderly, and inclined not to cause any trouble. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> And I don't really mean, you know, you love both of them, but whew, you can kind of say, oh, thank you, Jesus. He's home and he's obedient and he's doing what he should do. So Jacob was the type of person, like a husband, Rebecca, he also, he knew the prophecy um, over their lives, right? So Jacob, because he was home and he was a slickster, and, and, and what I like about God, later on you know we tend to reap what we sow so we have to be careful with the things that we do god don't forget man may forget but god certainly don't forget the things that we do so again we have unfortunately we want to admit it or not most parents have favorite children but since god is no respect of a person and we'll see that in acts 10 34 we should not initiate that in our homes. Whenever we do, we create potential conflict, um, whether it's in our home, even in church, Sunday school, um, even in our job environment. Anytime you favor one person over another, it can create a problem. And with children, it's called sibling rivalry, which can have devastating consequences in a family. So as a parent, we should work at showing equal love to their children. And so what I found out, even in minds, you, you, they both have different needs. So you tend to tend to the needs of that child. I once had someone um, ask, what child do you favor more? And I never was, I, I couldn't understand why they would even ask that question. That was number one. And number two, I hope they didn't think that they had favorites. And I always saw myself, my children, I loved them both, but they had different needs. And so whatever the need is at that time, you try to meet the need that you can for your children and not have favoritism, even if it doesn't come up to what you expect. 
you still have to have the love for them. And you still have not, you can't be favorite. You can't, well, he's doing good and he's not. Our job as parents is to intercede for our children and continue to pray for them, that they will come to a place where God has them. Amen. So here, once Jacob was cooking, and I'm coming to a close where Jacob was cooking some stew, and Esau came into the house. He had been hunting, and he had been working, and he smelled that soup, that stew, and he said he was famished. So here, Esau because of his um, uncontrollable desires, his, his character. We're talking about a character that he had. Um, he, was, he didn't have any patience. He wanted what he wanted now. He came in, he smelled the food and, and, and the stew. And, and in my mind, Jacob probably was preparing it that day for him. He knew his father was getting old and he probably was preparing this stew for Esau to come in because remember Jacob, you know, he's sitting home thinking and 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 he's a, a manipulator. So Jacob was cooking what was identified as stew, lentil stew. And so when Esau came in from the field, he said, oh, I'm, I'm famished, I'm hungry. And he came home from the day of hunting and he was famished. And so that left him in a position of being gullible. Verse 30, he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of your rest too. I'm famished. And this is why he was also called Edom. Arriving home, starving, and well, so-called starving condition. So he requested some stew. And Jacob before he gave him the stew, Jacob had a request. Jacob replied, listen, first sell me your birthright. He took advantage of him. Jacob took advantage of Esau's physical weakness and trapped him and deceived him to, uh, to take his birthright. So he, he convinced Esau to sell him his birthright. And so the birthright consists of a special right of the firstborn or the elder son in the family. This include a double portion of the inheritance. And in Deuteronomy 21, we can read this. Upon the father's death, the older son will become the head of the family and serve as the family priest. That's a blessing. This was the very covenant position that likelihood that being that when he sold his birthright, he would Jacob would inherit. So here's the thing to sell the power and the privilege that came with the birthright for a bowl of stew would have been unthinkable. Both Jacob and Esau were familiar with the benefits of the birthright. They both were familiar and Jacob wanted it badly. He was calculating and scheming. Jacob understood Esau's character and knew that under the right circumstances, he would give up the birthright. Mm. He wanted it and he waited until his brother weakness gave him the opportunity. I have a question just so we can think about, even though God had prophesied to Rebecca, that she would have two sons and Jacob would be the one who received the birthright. Do we think that it's still necessary to manipulate God in doing this? Was Rebecca doing what she thought was right in, 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 in incorporating, having her son Jacob do this to his son Esau? We'll see next week when Brenda teach the background, a little more of the background of what this came from. So here, undoubtedly, Jacob knew the prophecy of his mother, Rebecca. The oldest should serve the younger. So he took the matters into his own hand to gain the privilege and the status. So we can't say if he's guilty of being selfish, but what we can say is he's guilty of not waiting on God. 
So he had honorable motives, but his but his methods were wrong. And so unfortunately and sadly, things of a great spiritual value are often handled in a profane and crafty ways, and they should not be done. And that happens today. There are people who um, sometimes we believe that we are called and into a position and we don't wait on God. We want to get there as quickly as I want to. Actually, you have to wait on God. So you can move into the D position before you go to ABC and it just will, it, it will not turn out the way that you plan it to do. God has the plan for us. So like Esau, some people treat the spiritual and eternal things with contempt for they see them as having no real value. And like Jacob, others who may regard spiritual things highly use the higher regard to serve themselves through craftness and manipulation. Both of these attitudes leave a great deal to be desired, especially in believers. The final two chapters are, look, look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling him his birthright. And that's a sad thing. Esau responded before agreeing to Jacob that he had a lack of appreciation of spiritual things. So this here reveals Jacob's character first. He said to his brother, behold, I am at the point of die to die we might say like look I'm, I'm i'm hungry i'm about to die i'm about to faint so we don't know what point esau was really at of death because he was hunting and he was weary because he had a long day out but if he had valued his birthright certainly he could have endured the hunger a little more if he valued the things of God, certainly he would have waited a little longer. If he valued the, the covenant that God had made with his father, he would have waited a little longer. For I'm sure that like his brother, he knew how to cook. And besides, he was not going to die immediately, you know, take some time to, to leave here but he didn't value the things of God. And so do we value the things that God gives us? Here, it was his birthright, which was very important. But we live in a, a world now that we want it immediately. We want to have it our way. We don't want to wait for God. I prayed and now, you know, people say, wait on the Lord, but get up, wait. This is the opportunity to get it. This is for me now. Esau did not value the spiritual things, his stomach. And so the stomach represents the flesh. He represented, he wanted, his flesh was more important than waiting for what God had promised. And Esau said, what profit should this birthright do me? With this statement, Esau showed himself to be self-centered. He didn't um, see his birthright as a mean of preserving spiritual value for the future generation. He only cared about what birthright could do. I do have a question in reading this, and it's, a, um, you know, I was thinking, did Esau also know the promise that God had made to um, Rebecca that Jacob would be received? I don't want to take you another place, but it was just a thought. Maybe Esau knew. And he just didn't, he just gave up his birthright. It doesn't say it in the text, but I'm thinking maybe he didn't value his birthright because it was prophesied that Jacob would be the stronger. That could be a, a, a thought for us to think about. Pastor, I hope I didn't go too far out on that thought now, but it was just a thought. Maybe he didn't value it him because he didn't think he would be um, the one that would inherit it. But Jacob said, 33, but Jacob said, swear to me first. So he sworn an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Now, I also wondered, was there witnesses here? 
did so, was some of the people there to witness? Because when you sell your birthright, that's a that's big. Although the younger brother Jacob had his brother Esau right where he wanted him, he wasn't going to take any risk. To keep Esau from later changing his mind, Jacob said, swear to me first. So maybe at that point, your word was your bond. He made Esau take a, soul, a solemn oath concerning the transfer of his birthright. So we saw earlier, Jacob may have been aware of the prophecy that God gave his mother. So instead of waiting for God, he waited for the opportunity to help God fulfill the promise. And God forever needs, like our God needs help, but we think God needs help sometimes. Jacob, like his grandfather Abraham, thought he had to help God carry out the promise. And like Abraham, Jacob would reap a whirlwind, a whirlwind of trouble for trying to force God's hand. Yes, he will reap it. Truly, patience may be the hardest part of trusting God. Do you trust God today? Do we have enough patience to trust God today? But I found that if you're in the prayer closet and if you're in a place where intimacy and, and with God, then you'll know the voice of God. And when you know the voice of God, it enables you to trust God a little more. Because it's not easy because you got the world that's talking to you. You got the enemy that's talking to you. But we need to know the voice of God. And the voice of God sounds like no other. So to trust God and wait on God and to be patient until God move in his own timing. So we also, to close, to bring it to a close, Esau attitude, attitude showed that he was so unconcerned about his birthright. We don't want to be unconcerned about the things of God, that he didn't even hesitate to take the oath. Therefore, he sold his birthright unto Jacob and, and, and concluded he did not value his birthright. He tossed his birthright to the side. He agreed to the deal. So we see here, I just want to read Hebrews 12, 16, and 17. And the word of God says, lest there be any fornicator or profound person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Mm. This is Hebrews 12, 16, 17. So as I previous noted, a person birthright was a great value of ancient times. Esau, of course, should have never sold his birthright, selling it for something as food was even more applauding. One, on the other hand, Jacob should not have requested it, nor should he have accepted it as a price for food. He should have been willing to come to his brother aid at no cost. Are we our brother's keeper? Yes, we are our brother's keeper. 34, Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil soup, stew, and ate and drank, and then he got up and left. Esau, he exchanged the blessing for bread, resorted into a necessary deception by eight Jacob. And it's said because Jacob, it was already promised to Jacob that he would be possessed the birthright. But Esau sold what was rightfully his to satisfy a moment of desire of food. And doing it, he showed that he did not take this aspect of his inheritance seriously. 
So we in I end with this that this week lesson reveals that it's essential for us to trust the integrity of God's promises and his timing. God plans do not do not always align with our expectation and his ways are beyond our comprehension and beyond the capacity for us to even change. That's that to me change, you know, he made the plan, but we're going to alter the plan. What he has already proposed. Jacob scheme, but God was working it out according to his will and in his lives of the lives of Esau and Jacob. So sometimes God's method of selecting those he desired to use are often, often opposite from our methods. But God doesn't have to give us an explanation of who he chose. But without any explanation, God chose Jacob to continue working out his plan for salvation through the family of Abraham, despite all Jacob did. His actions had no bearings on God's promises to bless all the families from the earth to Abraham family. His redemptive plan of God cannot be sorted by humans effort. They often are driven by personal, that are often driven by personal ambitions. God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. God has a purpose for our lives. It can't be altered, it can't be changed, but we can make the wrong choices in life. So as believers, we have to be very careful with the choices that we make, the decisions that we do in our lives. And how do we be careful? They have to align with the word of God. Certainly there are times when we want to get up and go do and get it ourselves. But we have to wait on God because he truly has a a purpose for our lives that we have to be careful not to be impatient, not to make emotional decisions, not to make decisions on our feelings. It had nothing to do with your feelings. Many of the decisions God makes for us has nothing to do with how we feel. In fact, it's not how we feel. It's according to his will. So I give God the glory and the praise. I I pray that uh, this morning seemed to be a little difficult for me, but God has a way of doing what he does. And I thank each and every one um, of you for just listening. But stay focused on the Lord. Stay focused, Pastor. Let me stop. Do anyone have any questions or statements? Because one thing I do believe God has spoken to each and every one of you who read, who studied the lesson. And the it's open for statements, it's open for questions. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Good morning. Um, this lesson was very refreshing uh, for me, and I saw myself all over the lesson. Um, you know, sometimes you read scripture so many different times and you get a different revelation. And as soon as I'm, as I'm reading, I'm saying, wow, this is incest going on. So (laughs) I'm like, I'm like, whoa, you know, so I continue to read and, um, you know, the treasure here was that, you know, when you don't wait and rely on God, you know, you can kind of like change the trajectory of the, of the whole thing, not saying that you know, the promise will not come into fruition, but, you know, it's, it's just, you have to go backwards forward to kind of like get to where God wanted you to be. And um, in terms of the family, yes, I've, I've been asked that, you know, which kid of yours is the favorite because I have two boys and a girl and everybody swears that it's my oldest son. And then this one will say that it's, it's my middle son, um, you know, but, you know, I think all parents do have a special you know, child, not saying that it's special, but each one of them has a specialty in their own right. Um, And uh, I thought it was interesting too, that there was not a ceremonial, um, something ceremonial for the transfer of the birthright. But we just have to be careful. I just thought too that, 
you know, for him, he wasn't interested in the birthright. But when you think of it in the world, you know, and, and people think of it like as a title, you know, there's people who are big on titles, but then there's some people who just want to simply just do the work. And he wasn't interested in that. You know, but it's a dangerous thing to sell your soul just to have a title or to be in position. So for me, it was a very good lesson. Um, I saw myself, I saw my family in it, and um, well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Someone else? Someone else? I just wanted to say that this lesson was excellent. Um, I missed maybe seven minutes of it, but I was able to catch up and to understand exactly um, what had been going on and of today. And as a grandparent, um, I have two grandsons. And of course, the first one was uh, pushed a lot into a lot of different activities. And now you have a second one who needs to be able to do the same. It is, um, this was excellent. It was excellent because I know sometimes I might push one uh, grandson rather than pushing both and teaching them. That is my, that's my uh, job to teach them. This lesson was excellent and it was broken down very, very well, Sister um, Sparks. It was excellent. So thank you very much. And I'm glad I caught, very glad I caught this. And thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank anyone, you. Else, anyone else God gave revelation to? Um, and I thank you because what you do is you bring also um, what God has given you to the class. So anyone else have anything else they want to add before I turn it over to the pastor? And it will actually to Brenda, Sister Foreman, and then the pastor, Brenda. No, I'm good. You can You're good? turn over to okay. pastor. So um, Pastor Hawkins, please. God bless you this morning, Sister Johnny, and to our uh, <laughs> superintendent, Sister Hill. And we thank God for each and every one that's on the line. Uh, this is a very uh, a good lesson that we can make it relevant and apply it to our own lives, our own family structures. We can kind of identify with some of the things and issues that uh, Isaac and Rebecca dealt with. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sometimes we get in the way of our own selves. God have a plan and purpose for our lives. But sometime on our humanistic ways, uh, this shows us that these people are human, just like we, you and I. We lean on our own understanding. Amen. And so uh, I thank God for this lesson. This uh, shows how God is still able to work through the, uh, the affairs of men. Yeah, the affair. That's us. And still his will is accomplished. He's yes. patient. Uh, uh, sometime we delay our blessings not denied but it's delayed because of our own wheeling and dealing and uh, i just say i won't say even say wheeling and dealing but our own knowledge of level of understanding we think it ought to be this way when it comes to god when actually he outlines the plan for us and our lives Finish. and so this looks at the, the, the this is just shows how god orchestrated uh, uh the the covenant lineage the covenant lineage of the patriarchs so we all say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nobody says Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. So the point I'm trying to make is, is like the lesson said, God chooses uh, the youngest son, the twin. So in other words, brothers and sisters, God uh, uh, uses whom he chooses. Now, God knows the heart of the brothers, just like he knows you and our heart. He knows our spirit. He knows our intention. I don't care. You can be in the same, won't come out the same. It shows two different characters coming out the same womb. Yeah. And so some of us come out the same household, the same church, but God mm -hmm. knows the heart of each and every one. And it's already outlined, it's already prophesied. And so what I love about this scripture also, this, our lesson, it shows that uh, uh, Isaac was a man of prayer. As a husband, as a priest, you have a problem. Uh, he went to the Lord, amen. And we can, we learn a lot by, as men, amen, as husbands and fathers, 
you got an issue? I said, he took it to the Lord. My wife, it, 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 there's an issue with uh, us bearing. She's bearing and, uh, uh, and we, we have an issue. And God, you're able to fix it. Amen. Amen. So, and so I remember, uh, uh, and you know, you can, there's so many things you can apply. I often tell the story about how when uh, my wife and I got married and a couple of years, about a year went on, a year and a half, and there was no, uh, no, we, we wanted to have a child, but there was no, nothing going on. And one of the sisters recommend uh, 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 gynecologist, well, no, gyne obstetrician somewhere, one specialist, the person, a fertility doctor here. And she, we went down there, his name was Dr. West on Park Avenue 80, in the 80s, and no, in the lower 50s. And he, his consultation was $500. Amen. And I went on down there. He was examining my wife. He took urine. You know, that's the first thing he did. We took urine. And the thing about it was that I found we paid five hundred dollars. Amen. Just to find out when he come back that she was already pregnant. Amen. So while we was trying to figure it out, God had already worked it out. Amen. Some. Amen. Amen. So you, if you learn to wait on the Lord, he'll he'll work it for your good. Uh, and here's another thing. Uh, God does. God uses him. He does not always select and elect in the chronological order amen god moves in a mysterious way yes we understand the, the birthright of the older the birthright he gives a double portion a double blessing as we think about the prodigal son the older you know because he received two-thirds of the blessing because another portion because his role as the older was to take care of the home take care of the wife take care of the family so his portion and so uh yeah so god selected uh he can always move and select the least amen he can the least or the younger but that's god's choice and i can identify with that sometimes the last and the least is the one that god can use uh and I, you know some you know, so many things in this lesson you can relate to your own personal life uh i rem i i can on my father's side of the family i was you know every uh nobody knew me you know he was just like almost like just a seed plant at some aspect of point but you know, if you stay there and you stay before the Lord, God can elevate you in the family. So almost like the one that's rejected becomes the head cornerstone. Amen. Even in ministry, in ministry, I think about it. I was the last and least <laughs> licensed in ministry at Greater Central, you know, at that time during the time that we had a pastor. But God chose that. It wasn't my plan. So a lot of time when you talk about position and stuff like that, uh, we know it's all the birthright. But it's always been said that it's far better for the position to seek you. God, let God seek you, and then for you to seek a position. And then the the carelessness on on Esau part, right? Uh, we give up too much. He said, "What good is my birthright?" Uh, and I'm about to famish. And he carelessly gave away his birthright, which is his blessing, his covenant blessing. And and so here it is. We give up too much, brothers and sisters. We give up too too much. Uh, and get nothing uh, in return. We give up too much and get nothing in return. What does it mean to gain the world and lose your soul? He will later cry to his father Isaac for the blessing that he gave away. In other words, uh, he wanted that bowl of lentil, which is beans, amen? So he gave away his birthright for a bowl of beans. We give up too much and nothing in return. In other words, he got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. Let me say that again. He got what he wanted, which is a bowl of beans, a bowl of lentils, but he lost what he had. Amen. Uh, he gave up his birthright. And later on, if you stay with the story, this is a lesson, brothers and sisters, just don't stop today, but continue to read on how everything unfolds in the life of Isaac, in the life of, uh, uh, of Esau, in the life of, life of Jacob. It's a very interesting story. Amen. Amen. And then this whole family, when you look at, Rebecca, when you look at Jacob, when you look at the Uncle Laban, full of deception, trickery, you know, on that side of the family, they were all, all acquainted with trickery. Later on, Jacob's going to be deceived for 14 years. He think he's marrying the, the one, the woman he loved, which is Rachel. He had to wait seven years because he went to his Uncle Laban. Seven years he served him. And then at the day of wedding, he had, who it is, Leah. And then another seven years. Amen. For the handmaid of the uh, hand of Rachel. So, you know, Rebecca, she knew what the deal was. So, and, and here it is true. We got to be careful about showing favoritism. 
The Bible, the scripture said that Isaac loved Esau. Amen. And Rebecca loved they loved Jacob. There was division already in the house, you know? And so we have to be careful how we show our love toward all our children. And and uh, there's so many things that we can look at in our lesson today. Uh, uh, but God knows the destiny of all of us. And as he knew the destiny of Jacob, uh, and then here it is, last but not least, let me turn it over. You know, he was securing his heel or holding on to his heel. Amen. And so that's how some people are too today, holding on to your heel. Amen. Uh, uh, grabbing at the heel, people trying to hold you back. Amen. That's how we are too, like crabs in the barrel, trying to hold you back. But the thing about holding on, uh, holding somebody back, uh, they can't go nowhere. But you can't go nowhere either because you're busy holding on them to them. <laughs> you're trying to block them and stop them, you know. But God ultimately, uh, God used Jacob, changed his name to Israel, amen, even though in spite of all his shortcomings. And, 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 and through him, we have the 12 sons of Israel, as we know today, are the 12 tribes of Israel. And so we thank God. God ultimately will. His ultimate will is going to be done. His sovereign will is going to be done. And so uh, he blessed Esau. He blessed Ishmael. Amen. He took care of them. And even today, these people are still at, at odds with the children of Israel. And so it's a the generational uh, uh, at odds. Amen. Uh, you will later read where uh, Esau. Uh, yeah. Uh, you will later read where, oh, man, Esau was so mad with Jacob when he found out. Read on. That's what I'm trying to tell y'all. Read on and find out what happened. Uh, what happened when, when Isaac blessed uh, uh, Jacob through deception, thinking it was Esau. But once that blessing was given out, it cannot be retracted. And that's what he told Esau. You know, and, and in his heart, Esau proposed that he's going to kill his brother. That's why uh, Rachel, Rebecca had to send him away quickly in a haste. Amen. Because there was going to be bloodshed. But ultimately down the line, how God was able to reconcile, you know, because Jacob was fearful for his brother for a long time. Amen. So read the rest of the story and see how God, even in the midst of turmoil in the family and trickery, uh, how God still worked it for our good. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God uses or chooses whom he desire to use. Amen. For his glory, because ultimately God knows the heart of every individual and he knows the spirit of every individual. Amen. And sometimes, uh, uh, as Grandma used to say, that if, uh, if you make a if you, if you make a hard bed, you got to lay in it. I believe something like that. Amen. So be careful how we make our beds. You know, <laughs> in other words, be careful how we live our lives because some of that stuff you're going to have to give an account, and you got to reap it, and you got to deal with the consequences. Amen. Amen. God bless you in your care, Sister Superintendent. Thank you, Sister uh, Durant. Great job this morning. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. God chooses the younger twin. God always is up to something, whether he is speaking or he is quiet. Even in his word, he says, our thoughts are not his thoughts. We can't even comprehend uh, God's thoughts unless we he revealed them to us through the Holy Spirit. Thank God then for the Holy Spirit, our guide and our director and our comforter. The church school is a blessing to all who wants to know more about God's word and how we should grow spiritually. Thank you for your support and our finance department. Thank you so much. Uh, you have been faithful to the church school by Giblify or even in the envelopes on Sunday worship service. And also um, your prayers. We thank you once again. The envelopes for the church school are available uh, from the ushers in the back of the church. You can request uh, an envelope.
We also have our new books. And if you don't have one, you can pick one up on Sunday morning after morning service. And the fee is $10. We want to thank you. And we are still wearing our masks in the sanctuary. You hear on TV, I believe our governor says that we can remove our masks on the mass transportation. But we want to be safe. So we are going to be listening to our COVID committee, and they're going to let us know if we're going to still be wearing our masks and the social distance. We want to be safe. Okay. Brenda, you have any remarks? No, you can go ahead and dismiss. Okay, then. And the one that has a new book, We'll be turning to our prayer on page 23 and read our prayer. Father, we celebrate that you have chosen to work through us, your people. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Even when we fail to live holy lives, prepare us so that we can live out our purposes in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thought to remember God's plans will be fulfilled, even though I'll despise your efforts. Okay, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in our sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you. Tomorrow morning service will be at 11 a.m., 11 a.m., we're going back to our regular morning service on Sunday at 11 a.m. Hope to see you then. God bless you. Be safe. Thank you, Sister Joni. God bless you. Thank you. Everyone be blessed. Yeah, thank you for this Sunday school lesson, Joan. You're very good. Thank you. Oh, hi, Sister Garland. <laughs> thank you, sis. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Everyone be blessed. Have a blessed day. You too. You too. I was.